I, I do want to start by saying I appreciate Hassan giving me a promotion. I am not a professor of physics, and I'm a science journalist. I, I worked closely with a, a physicist when I wrote this book who made sure that I got the science right, and I made sure he got the words right, and I, I think it came out okay in the end. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about uh, the ghost particle, as you can see, which is the neutrino. But I wanted to start from a different place, and that is... Um, some of you may not have realized that about seven weeks ago, something very important happened in astronomy. Uh, it had to do with this. You may not recognize it instantly. This is an artist's impression of the, of the Milky Way galaxy. It's not the way it looks to you because we're actually in one of those arms. So to us, it might look more familiar like this uh, above our heads. The, the Milky Way has been, is one of the most uh, um, often studied and observed uh, objects just because it's so huge. It takes up such an enormous part of our, our sky. It's been a source of, of myths and, and art and science for as long as recorded history has existed and probably before that. Uh, in this particular case, this is an image of, a, uh, of the Milky Way as it, as it was interpreted to be a serpent by some of the peoples in Australia as long as 40,000 years ago. So uh, over the... In the Recent centuries, though, we've expanded beyond just looking at the galaxy with our eyes, and now we can look at it with a variety of other means, including uh, uh, radio waves, which are the low energy end of the spectrum, um, various emissions from, from uh, chemicals in space, infrared, which you're, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, optical, which is how it looks to your eyes, uh, X-ray, uh, and finally the highest energy end of the spectrum, which is gamma rays. In all of these cases, Light is the, is the medium that we use. And so for the, for the very first time in, in all of history, as far as we know, we have found a way to look at the universe with something else. This does not involve light at all. And as you can probably guess from the title of this talk, it is an image of the, of the Milky Way using neutrinos, which are massive particles, unlike light. And there are, this may not be the most detailed image that you've seen, but it is the first image of the, of the galaxy with neutrinos. It's the first image of anything uh, in space using something besides, besides light. The way they did that was using um, detectors in, the, in Antarctica. Uh, this is a very large array of detectors called the uh, Ice Cube uh, Experiment. It involves, I think, about 5,000, let me see if I have the details here, um, back up, about 5,160 detectors on 86 strings of of, uh, uh, of hung down into the ice, like uh, 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 roughly like uh, 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 pearls on strings that detect light coming, going through the ice. And what they typically see is a, a neutrino, a high energy neutrino might come to us from, from some random source. It could be a black hole, it could be galact uh, uh, cosmic rays or something. That, and if it's high enough energy, and if it's the right type of neutrino, it can cause a, a streak of light in the, in the detector. And if you trace that back, you get some idea of where it came from. For the most part, though, most of the neutrinos that, that hit Ice Cube cause what's called a cascade. And cascades, unfortunately, don't point as nicely towards their origin as, as these, these uh, streaks do. Now, over the course of the time that, new, that Ice Cube has been running, only a very few of, the, of these, tra these uh, long trails that we see have been identified to come from a specific source. Um, and so the cascade, because the information didn't seem to have pointing, pointing information, most of those cascades had been thrown away over the years. Hundreds of thousands of these observations had essentially been discarded until just a few years ago when uh, the Ice Cube collaboration uh, was, had an experiment run by one of the researchers from Drexel University who now applied artificial intelligence to look at these, these uh, what they call trash detections at, at uh, Ice Cube. And they were able to train the artificial intelligence system to deduce from those cascades that there is, in fact, a structure out there, and then they can identify the, the, the Milky Way galaxy. And this is what the, uh, the astronomer, her name is Naoko Kurahashi Nielsen from Drexel University, said that when she first became a neutrino physicist, she always used to make these quotes when she said uh, neutrino astronomy. She says she doesn't do that anymore because now we can start, this is the very beginning of a brand new branch of neutrino, of astronomy that does not involve light anymore. And there are some distinct advantages that I'm going to get to about that in just a few minutes. But I wanted to talk to you about the particle that, 
that is leading to this, what I consider a revolution in, in astronomy. This happens to be a, uh, uh, a fanciful little squishy character that you can buy. This is not what a neutrino looks like, but it, uh, it's, it's a handy thing for some of the demonstrations here. So I don't know how many of you are neutrino, are particle physicists. Do we have a lot of particle physicists in the room? Because um, if you're not a particle physicist, you might be wondering right about now, what, what is a neutrino exactly? If you are a particle physicist, you might be wondering, what is a neutrino exactly? And <laughs> the reason I say that is because if you look at all the things that we know about neutrinos, this is the list, and I'm not going to go through those entirely. If you look at all the things that we know we don't know about neutrinos, it's longer. If you have never heard of neutrinos and you walked into this room, a particle physicist only knows about 40% more than you do about neutrinos. That makes neutrinos the most mysterious particles that we know of in the universe. There are some particles we know exist and we know a lot about. There are some that we aren't sure exist and we know very little about. Neutrinos are the only one that we know exists and we know comparatively little amount. So the question, an obvious another question, is where do neutrinos come from? Most of the, most of the neutrinos that are current, most of the ones that you're experiencing right now in the universe come from stars, including our sun. Uh, another source of neutrinos is high energy particles raining down from space. They're typically uh, protons. We often don't know where they come from. And when they hit the atmosphere, they cause a huge shower of particles, and a lot of that shower is neutrinos. They're also produced artificially in things like nuclear reactors. Uh, the Earth has ores, has minerals inside of it that are radioactive, and those radioactive, uh, uh, partic uh, those radioactive materials are a large part of what creates the heat in the Earth that, that causes the, uh, the motion of, the, of, the, of the, the, the liquid motion of the interior of the Earth that causes the magnetic field, which makes life possible on this planet. And so those neutrinos can help us see where those are. And then finally, my watch, which I'm wearing right now, as a matter of fact, is also a source of neutrinos. It has in it some, uh, some tritium glow tubes. Those are filled with tritium gas. The tritium gas breaks down. It creates an electron, which hits a, piece of, a bit of phosphorus inside these tubes. That electron causes light. But the neutrino just races straight out. So this, my watch is a source of 5 million neutrinos. I apologize if, you're, uh, if you are offended by being uh, 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 pierced by these neutrinos, but we have no choice. They go in all directions. Some are going through me now, and some are going through you. But it's a relatively small part of the neutrinos that are coming to you at this moment. The, the sun itself is a source of about 100 trillion, trillion, trillion neutrinos every second. Of those, 100 trillion of them are passing through each one of you each second of your entire life. I asked uh, an artificial intelligence program to give me a picture to try to demonstrate this. This is what an AI chatbot thinks this might look like. Apparently, chatbots can't tell the difference between grains of sand and neutrinos. But if neutrinos were the size of a grain of sand, the amount going through you each second would be enough to fill an entire shipping container, an international shipping container, every second. If you could take a snapshot of the neutrinos in you, besides the fact that you win a Nobel Prize for the technology, you could see that you have about 15 million neutrinos in your entire body at any given instant. And there are three to 500 of them in the tip of your, your little finger, depending on roughly on how big your little finger is. <coughs> but don't worry, they are mostly harmless. Um, and I say mostly, we'll get back to that later. In your entire lifetime, probably two neutrinos on average will stop somewhere in your body. It'll convert one of the atoms in your body to a different type of atom in your body, but you won't notice because you have trillions of other atoms that are, that are doing just fine. <clears throat> so the, the initial idea about neutrinos, no one, they didn't, de nobody detected neutrinos initially, and nobody really expected neutrinos initially. Neutrinos came about because of a real problem in, in uh, the blossoming field of quantum mechanics early in the 1900s. There had been discovered in 1899 three types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, not very imaginatively named. The first one, alpha, is roughly a helium atom that is spit out from a radioactive particle, uh, the core of a helium atom. The third one, gamma, is just light. It's gamma radiation. The second one, the, the second one that Rutherford discovered, is called beta radiation, just because it was the second one. But it actually involves an electron being ejected from a naturally radioactive uh, atom. And in that case, if you look at this picture of, uh, of a hypothetical radioactive atom, the red particles represent protons, the blue ones represent neutrons, 
And when this reaction happens, one of the neutrons spontaneously converts to a proton. When it does that, it, it, the, the atom becomes positive, one, one positive charge more charge than it was prior to the neutron turning into a proton. And that has to be balanced by something else. And that's balanced by a negatively charged electron that goes zooming away. So one of the problems, the problem with beta decay, is that the particle doesn't zoom away at the same speed every time. So that means there different, there's different amounts of energy involved with each, each one of these electrons. And that's a problem, because you would expect, if you have two particles, one that's the source and one that is the part flying away, if the same reaction is happening every time, the same energy is involved every time, it should move away at the same speed every time, in the same way that if you fire a gun, you have a gun in your hand, you have a bullet that's sailing through the air, as long as your ammunition is identical every time, that bullet should fly away at exactly the same speed every time. But it doesn't. And so one of, the fam one of the founders of modern quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr, noticed that there's, that's a real problem for a couple of reasons. And one of them is that unlike a lot of physics, quantum mechanics can run both ways. It is not directional. There's no, you don't have to worry about thermodynamics at the quantum scale. And so these, you could, in theory, run these very same reactions in the opposite direction. You could take a, uh, an atom, fire an, fire an electron at it, and it should absorb it and just become a different uh, atom with a slightly higher number of neutrons. So, and Bohr, who, uh, who's the father of the, the, uh, what's called the Bohr model of the atom, which is where most people have probably heard of him, he noted that you could now play a game. You could take one of these radioactive atoms, you could let it emit an electron, and you could just select the ones that send out high energy electrons. Then you could use that electron, that energy from that electron, to run a small machine. Then take that now low energy electron, now that you've sucked away the energy, and send it back to the atom that emitted one in the first place, and convert it back to the very same atom that you started with. Now the problem with this is that when you start and end with the same atom, there's no reason you can't do it again. If you can do it again, you can do it forever. If you can do it forever, that means that you now have this source of free energy, and thermodynamics is kaput. Um, that's a, that is a huge problem. It is a problem that, uh, that many scientists struggled with for, for decades after, after beta decay was discovered. Uh, one physicist in particular, Wolfgang Pauli, a colorful fellow, discovered, came up with an idea. He said that it's not that, the energy, it's not that there's more energy that's available that you can now continue running this cycle over and over again. It's that there's an invisible particle that we don't know what it is, and the energy goes away with that particle. It's not available to run your perpetual motion machines or your free energy machines because it's now zipped away into, into space. But he, had, he knew that a lot of people had been looking for, these, for this invisible particle for a long time. They'd been studying beta decay, nobody could find it. So the simplest answer was just to say, it is un unfindable, it does not exist. It's just fundamentally undetectable. The problem with that, well, it's, and in, to summarize the, the, the various uh, uh, factors in this, or the, 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 tra the traits of this neutrino, Powell's neutrino, is that it had to be an elementary particle. It, to make the whole thing simple, that goes along with uh, other elementary particles like electrons and quarks. It had to have low mass, and we know that because you could look at the electrons coming out. Some of them had a lot of energy, some of them had a little bit of energy, but they, the, the way it was distributed made it clear that whatever that other thing was, it had to be extremely light compared to an electron. It had to have no electric charge because we already know that the proton and the electron have balanced out the electric charge. It had to have something called spin. So when the electron is created, you end up with a new particle with a, with a certain amount of spin. And spin in the early quantum mechanics, and even now, is known to be conserved. So if you have spin in the electron, you have to have the opposite spin in the neutrino. And that, so you, in addition to, to accounting for this lost energy, Pauli's neutrino took care of this other issue with quantum mechanics and settled a lot of the accounting issues that come with radiation. And of course, it had to be inherently undetectable. And that was almost as big a problem as not knowing how what was going on with beta decay in the first place. A lot of people couldn't stand it. In fact, Wolfgang Pauli himself was a little sheepish about the idea. He said, I've done a terrible thing today. I've suggested something which cannot, can never be verified experimentally. And yet he's still stuck with it. And, and a fair number of scientists said it just makes too much sense. We can't not have neutrinos, because if we don't have neutrinos, then we have a breakdown in physics, and we have to go back to the beginning, and we get to throw, we get to build perpetual motion machines, we get to build free energy machines, and we, for hundreds of years, people have been proving that that couldn't happen. 
As a matter of fact, Bohr hated the idea so much that he, of neutrinos so much, that he preferred to believe that there was no thermodynamics. He was willing to, this is the father of quantum mechanics. And had anybody else suggested that, they would have probably been drummed out of the physics community entirely. Bohr was such a giant of the community that even for a brief time, he could say, maybe thermodynamics is just a quaint idea left over from an earlier age, and we should move on and accept that, that something else is happening. <clears throat> Hans Bethe actually uh, uh, analyzed Pauli's neutrino, and he, he determined that the chances of a neutrino emitted by a beta particle in my watch, for instance, um, during beta decay in my watch, that would, if it were to pass through the Earth, the chances that it would stop somewhere in the Earth were very small. There's a, a, hundred, a, one, a one trillion to one chance that that, uh, a, that neutrino would stop somewhere in the Earth. It's just going to fly on through. And he concluded in a paper that he wrote in Nature that there is pra no practically possible way of, of observing the neutrino in cons uh, consistent with what Pauli had proposed in the first place. But that didn't stop a lot of people from trying. Um, unfortunately, most of them were, well, all of them were unsuccessful until a few years later. But James Chadwick down here in, uh, in Cambridge wanted to, he tried looking for them in what are called cloud chambers, which is how we've detected a number of particles, including this trace of a positron, which is the antimatter version of the electron. This is the first image of a positron. They also found muons and various other particles, but there was no sign of a neutrino because the neutrino is chargeless, it's, it's very low mass, and doesn't interact very well. There was also no sign of them in the Hoburn Station, which was an experiment uh, uh, run by Maurice Nemias in, in the 1930s. He had assumed that neutrinos had a much, much larger interaction with the magnetic field than they in fact do. And he went down and set up an experiment in the hopes that he could shield out cosmic rays that might interfere with his experiment and look for neutrinos. And unfortunately, I was there this afternoon. I didn't see any while I was there either. This picture is from uh, yesterday, actually. Um, and uh, Horace Crane of the University of Michigan didn't find any in a bag of, of salt. He, what he did was he took a, a radioactive source, um, put it inside the bag of salt, under the assumption, based on Beta's analysis, that one of those neutrinos could hit a chlorine atom and convert it into a radioactive form of sulfur. Then you would just take the bag of, sand, a bag of salt, you study it for a little while and look for this radiation, and you could see it. And it would have worked if this bag of salt had been roughly the size of the Rock of Gibraltar. Uh, which is a trillion times the size of this bag. Unfortunately, he, he was limited to a two-pound bag of salt. So there are ways to find neutrinos. Clearly, because they interact so rarely, the, the most obvious ones is to build bigger detectors, like something the size of the Rock of Gibraltar, or to do much longer duration experiments. If you have a very small likelihood of something happening in a spe specific amount of time, if you do it longer, you extend the length of your experiment, it increases the chances of finding something. And finally, you can use a much more intense source of neutrinos. When Pauli came up with this idea and Beta proposed that, that the chances of one stopping somewhere in the Earth were next to zero, they didn't have an intense source of neutrinos. But Beta was involved in a project that you might have heard about, um, and that was at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, where they were building the first atomic bombs. And they built, in fact, the most intense source of neutrinos that the planet had ever seen to that, to that point. And so these two fellows, Fred Reines, who had worked with Oppenheimer to develop the bomb, and Clyde Cowan, who had come along later, decided to place a detector very close, in fact, 137 feet, from a nuclear detonation in the deserts of New Mexico. And the plan here was when the, the bomb was detonated, they would cut the cord in, in this tunnel and drop a detector for about two seconds. After, the, after the, uh, the weapon was detonated, it would create a huge number of neutrinos, or excuse me, of neutrons. Those neutrons break down over the course of about 10 seconds. But in the first two seconds, a certain fraction of them will. And there would be a super intense burst of neutrinos for those two seconds. The detector that would then land on a pillow of, of feathers and foam rubber, and they would go back later when it was safe, excavate the, the, the hole and look for, the, for this detector, which hopefully has survived the, the massive explosion. But in a, they had already dug this, this tube, this tunnel down in the desert. It cost them $7,500. I have the receipt at home, in fact. Um, but as they were about to install their detector, they had another conversation with the, leader, the lab leader at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and he said, well, maybe instead of just having the most intense source of neutrinos, 
How about a pretty intense one that you run for a long time? And so they decided to move to another part of the nuclear weapons industry in the United States, and that is this reactor in, in Aiken, South Carolina, uh, South Carolina yeah, where they were making plutonium for the nuclear weapons. And they, instead of having a, an enormous sudden burst, they looked at this steady stream of neutrinos, which is significantly higher than the solar neutrinos going through you right now. There's 50 trillion of these neutrinos per square centimeter, roughly this big, um, per second going through the detector at that time. And they were, in that amount of time, able to count about three new neutrinos an hour. That essentially saved physics from this thermodynamic catastrophe that, uh, that, um, that would have come about had uh, beta, beta, part, beta decay not been explained in this way. And Bohr came around and he was okay with that now. Uh, so at this point, to update Pauli's neutrino a little bit, it, we do know it's a new elementary particle at that time. It's, it's much lighter than an electron. It has a spin a half, uh, no electric charge, and is just difficult to detect. It's not inherently undetectable. It is still extremely difficult to detect. Uh, Hans Bethe was later confronted uh, by uh, Fred Reines, who was one of the discoverers and later won the Nobel Prize for, de for the detection of the electron neutrino and asked about this statement that there's no, <coughs> excuse me, no practical way of observing the neutrino. And his response is, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the papers. <laughs> so after they established that neutrinos existed, it was time to look at the, the most intense source after uh, uh, reactor breed breeder reactor sources and after bombs, and that is the, the neutrinos coming from the sun. And this is a, it's an important question because the, the, the sunlight that you see is quite old. The, the, the neutrinos and the photons that are produced by the sun are created in the same reactions in the same place at the same time in the core of the sun. But it takes about 200,000 years for the photons to, to wend their way out from the center. The neutrinos, on the other hand, as we mentioned, they're difficult to detect, which means that they sail through things like the sun instantaneously, that, well, almost at the speed of light, which means that it takes a neutrino about eight minutes to go from the core of the sun to Earth. It takes light about 200,000 years and eight minutes, because it takes 200,000 years to get to the surface and then another eight minutes to get to us. So if the, if the center of the sun were to suddenly wink out of existence, you wouldn't notice anything for hundreds of thousands of years, but neutrino physicists around the world would be in a panic. Now that we knew that these neutrinos were coming, the, the next thing to do was to, was, to, was to build detectors that could find them. Now, since you can't turn up the neutrino intensity in the way that, that Rhinus and Cowan relied on the intense sources of, of reactors, and you, one way would be to get closer to the sun, but that's difficult. The easiest way to do it is to build a bigger detector. And so uh, a, a, an experimentalist named Ray Davis filled a tank with 100,000 gallons of, of dry cleaning fluid. The dry cleaning fluid contains lots of chlorine in it. And that chlorine, if it, if it interacts with the neutrino, is converted into a radioactive form of argon. He could then, in theory, look at this tank that contains more atoms of, R, of, of chlorine in it, more molecules of cleaning fluid in it, than there is all the sand on the beaches. And he could find the eight to 10 argon atoms in it that were radioactive, pull them out and look at and observe them later to count how many neutrinos they are. It was an astounding engineering uh, experiment and that alone is worth a book, but we're just gonna leave it at that for now. The, the, they located the detector under the ground to protect it from, uh, from the radiation that would come from cosmic rays and other things that might interfere with, his, with their experiment. And his colleague, John Bacall, a theoretician that worked with him on the experiment, calculated that they should find seven to eight solar neutrinos a day. Davis found less than three. So there was, a, a, again, we had a problem with neutrinos. What's going on with the neutrinos? And there were lots of suggestions. Uh, some of them were kind of bleak. All, two thirds of them were missing. So Ray Davis wrote to one of his colleagues and suggested someone had perhaps forgotten to turn on the sun while he was running his experiment. But the more serious objections or more serious concerns is that we don't really understand solar fusion. Um, that seemed unlikely because Hans Bethe, who had been so instrumental both in developing the bomb and helping to understand how neutrinos work, was key to, to describing the, the fusion in the sun. And he seemed to get most of those things right. So not many people believe that. Uh, 
Another possibility was that the sun isn't run on fusion at all, but there's a black hole at the center, and the light was coming as parts of the sun were being sucked into the black hole. There was a huge burst of energy every time something like that happened. Uh, that also seemed relatively unlikely. Uh, the sun is too old for that, thing, that sort of thing to be happening. The next one is this bleak possibility that the sun is dead and that all of life would be gone on the planet within about 200,000 years. There was also the possibility uh, that there was something wrong with the experiment. Although John Bacall, at one point, asked his, uh, his team to put an unspecified number of radioactive argons in his 100,000 gal uh, gallon tank and not tell him how many they were and challenged him to find them, and he found every single one of them. So he was a very good experimentalist, and it seemed unlikely to him and to John Bacall that he had made some sort of mistake with his experiment. So that left one final culprit. Darn it, there you go. And that is that there is something wrong with neutrinos. And in fact, if you look at these nefarious characters, you might suspect that that is indeed the case. The fact is that John Bacall and Ray Davis were looking for one type of neutrino, and that's the one in, in, to the lower left, that's an electron neutrino. Their experiment was not sensitive to muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos. The thing is the sun doesn't make uh, muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos. It only makes electron neutrinos. But it turned out that the solution to this was that the neutrino doesn't stay an electron neutrino as it comes out. It actually shifts from one type of neutrino to another as it makes its way out of the sun. We call this now uh, neutrino oscillations. And this is my little uh, illustration of it. But we also, this is the most technically challenging part of the, of the talk, so I brought a little demonstration um, to help you to understand. But there are, there's another way of looking at these neutrinos. So there are three flavor neutrinos, one associated with the electron, one with the muon, and one with the tau particle. Those are heavier versions of particles very much like electrons, and it makes a little family of, of particles. But another way to look at it, once, a, once a, a neutrino leaves its source in a particular flavor, electron flavor, it actually travels as three other types of neutrinos that we call mass states. Uh, they're not very creatively named, mass states one, two, and three. The electron neutrino happens to be mostly State number one, which I have uh, represented here with a green, a little green blob, a, a piece of clay that my, my daughters helped me paint. And a little bit of mass state number two and a little bit of mass state number three. So if I were to, and the way it's represented here is by the amplitude tells you how much, uh, what, what portion of it is, is inside the, the flavor of the neutrino. So if you were to swing these, and look at how far they're swinging, an electron neutrino has a large swing on mass state one, a small swing on mass state two, and a very tiny swing on mass state number three. A muon neutrino is a, is a slightly uh, larger uh, percentage that consists of the mass state number three, and the tau neutrino is much, much more mass state number three. And the way that oscillations work, this is actually a very good um, demonstration of exactly the physics. It's the same physics, the same mathematics, it's a different system. If you write it down, you could, you could see parallels between the two. So, this is my daughter who helped me to make this uh, device, and I'll play this over here at the same time that I play with this, this, the, the, the system on this side. But she shows you here how if you start out essentially with a muon neutrino by giving it a lot of mass state number three, and then let it go for a little while, the energy shifts over to the other two uh, mass states. And now what you see on the screen is something that's much more like an electron neutrino. And it's now, it's oscillating back, and now it's much more like a, a tau neutrino. And in the middle, it's a mix of muon and tau neutrinos. And essentially, it's exactly the same math. So this, the fact that neutrinos oscillated from one flavor to another as they came to us from the sun told us that neutrinos had mass, because mass states are what make it oscillate at all. And this was astounding. There are no other particles that do that. And so if you look at the, part, all, the family of the particles in the standard model, this includes the quarks in this lavender color, the, the reddish color on the side are the particles that carry force, and down at the bottom is the family of leptons, which include the electron, the muon, and the tau particle, and their partners, the electron neutrino, mu, uh, uh, muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. They make a nice little collection because when there's an experiment that creates an electron neutrino, there's also an electron created at the same time. When there's an experiment, when there's an event that causes a muon neutrino, there's a muon created at the same time. And this is the same with the tau. The problem is, oscillations is a, are a real problem for the standard model of physics because this is a beautiful family except that 
neutrinos in this model should not have any mass. So the fact that the neutrinos that come to us from the sun are not electron neutrinos tells you that there's something really deeply wrong with the standard model of physics. It's close, but it also means it's a really exciting time to be involved in physics because we need to figure out what that answer is. For now, neutrinos answer a lot of questions, but they bring along the fact that, that physics is not at all complete when it comes to uh, the standard model of particle physics. So now if we're going to update Pauli's uh, neutrino once again, uh, it is, as we said, an elementary particle. It has low mass, no electric charge, spin a half. They don't interact with the strong force that holds the atomic nucleus together. They do, I don't mention gravity because gravity is a questionable force. It's an entirely different problem. It's, a, it's probably a Sean Carroll sort of a problem. But it's, uh, it, the fact that neutrinos don't interact with the strong force is why they pass through things so easily. They only interact on a very short range using what's called the weak force, which means that that's why they can pass to the Earth or trillions of miles of lead and have essentially no chance of stopping. And they oscillate among flavors as they travel. So if you remember that long list of things we know and don't know about neutrinos, a lot of that is, contin is contained in my book, but I'm gonna focus just on the things that, re that are involved with this, the fact that they have uh, very low chances of interacting with things and the fact that they oscillate as they travel because those lead to some very important uh, cosmic issues. One of them is that you can look at the Earth with neutrinos. When neutrinos pass through material, like when they pass through the sun, because the material is denser, they, their oscillations actually speed up a little bit. And you can now say that we have, suppose you have an electron neutrino on one side of the Earth, and it passes th through to the other side of the Earth, two things happen. Some of them get absorbed, so there's a little bit of a shadow, and some of them oscillate at a different rate. And so now you can take neutrinos from the sun, put a detector on the other side, and I can tell you what's inside the, the Earth. Currently, uh, geologists use seismic waves to, to make those sorts of observations, but there's a limit to how well you can do that. Neutrinos, there is no limit. As we build better and better detectors, we'll have a much better image of the inside of the Earth using neutrinos from the sun and other sources than we could from any, uh, an, any um, a seismic approach. And in fact, there's long been a debate about how the Earth works. Some people have said that perhaps there are are, uh, there is a natural nuclear reactor at the center of the Earth that, that explains where the heat is coming from. And that has already been disproven using neutrinos in experiments like this and another one I'm going to mention. Um, in addition to neutrinos coming from the sun and passing through the Earth, the Earth itself is a source of what we call geoneutrinos. So the material that I talked about earlier, the, the, the beta decay particle, the beta decay sources, these, these radioactive elements, are scattered throughout the Earth. And so now you can look at, you can use that to deduce the, the composition of the Earth by measuring the geoneutrinos that are coming out of the Earth. They've only just built detectors that are sensitive enough to do that, but we can already look at the composition and tell you where these various elements are, and they tend to be associated with the silicates, with the, the parts of the Earth in the outer part, the flowing magma of the Earth. So very soon, we're not quite there yet, we'll be able to use neutrinos to look at the neutrinos coming up from our feet and see exactly what's going on inside the heart of the Earth. Another possibility, uh, and this is uh, from research about a decade old now, and that is, I mentioned gravity. Gravity is a, a strange force, but the, the fact is that we know how much the Earth weighs primarily based on looking at the interaction between planets as they orbit. But those interactions don't distinguish between matter that you're familiar with and dark matter, which you may or may not have heard of, which there's a halo of dark matter around us, so it, and in theory, it doesn't interact either. So a certain amount of the Earth is probably made of dark matter. Right now, the understanding is that neutrinos don't interact with dark matter. And the reason that's important is because now we can take neutrinos and, that come from cosmic rays, when a cosmic ray strikes the, the atmosphere and creates this shower of, we know the proportion that are electron neutrinos, we know the proportion that are muon neutrinos, as they pass through the Earth, they oscillate in ways that reflect how much matter there is. So you can look at neutrinos that, that, are, caused, that are created on the northern side of the Earth, measure them in the ice cube observatory on the southern part of the Earth, look at their oscillations, and get a pretty good estimate of how much the Earth weighs, but only the matter part. Right now, these estimates are only good to about 10%. It's not a very good estimate. It's certainly not good enough to tell you how much is made of dark matter. It'll, they're going to have to be hundreds to thousands of times uh, higher precision in order to tell, but we will be able soon to measure the amount of dark matter in the Earth using neutrinos. 
The, the, and this ties back to the very beginning. We are, we're just beginning to use neutrinos for astronomy outside of the fact that the sun, we, we can see the sun. There are only a few things that we have so far been able to see with neutrinos. The sun is so close and so intense that we know the, the sun is there. Even if you weren't looking, you could look in your neutrino detect, detector and tell that the sun is there. It's also been used uh, uh, just uh, uh, by chance. In 1987, there was a supernova that went off uh, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is not too far from our, our galaxy. And before it showed up in the sky, 25 neutrinos turned up in detectors around the, around the, the globe. Uh, Fred Rhinus, the di discoverer of the neutri neutrino, did a uh, calculation and said that there was one chance in a Google, which is not just a search engine, it's a number, it's 10 to the 100, it's 10 with 100 zeros over it, uh, after it. And he, he calculated there was only one chance in 10 to the 100, 10 with 100 zeros after it, that this was from something that was not affiliated with a supernova. So in a sense, uh, a few hours before supernova 1987A appeared in the sky, we got a starting gun in the form of neutrinos that told us that this supernova was going to happen. Unfortunately, nobody was looking at the neutrino detectors at the time, so we missed the first several hours of this supernova. Uh, despite that, tens of thousands of articles have been written about the supernova, and thousands have been, and of articles have been written just about those 25 neutrinos, and many hundreds of PhDs have been earned from those hundreds of, of neutrinos. We expect to see about two supernova of that size near our galaxy per century. We haven't seen one since 1987A, but when the, the next one comes, we're going to be ready for it. The, the, the globe is now covered in neutrino detectors. There's a system called the Supernova Early Warning System that when they see that signal, they're going to tell all the astronomers to pay attention this time. So we're going to see the supernova as it first begins. So that's the second astronomical object that we've seen with neutrinos. The third, third, fourth, and fifth, actually, is uh, neutrinos that, we, that appear to be coming from these very violent events that involve black holes. So this is an image of a black hole uh, tearing apart a star. Um, and I think just a few years ago was the first time Ice Cube saw a neutrino that seemed to come from a direction where we knew that one of these things called a tidal disruption event was coming. So there's another spot in the sky that we can see. And then there are blazars, which are these very active galaxies. They're, they, we assume they're, power, they're, they're, run by, or they're powered by supermassive black holes. They're eating material. As they eat that material and it falls in, it creates enormous bursts of, of particles. So we have now five or six places that you could point into the sky and say, there's a neutrino, and there's a neutrino. These are these various sources. But this image that I showed you at the beginning is one that includes, inside of it, things like that. It includes uh, supernovas, it includes these tidal disruption events, and it includes other sources of, of particles, of neutrinos, that we haven't yet identified. It's going to take more analysis to pin down where they are precisely. And right now, the, the sort of hazy smudges you see are only hazy smudges because the artificial intelligence hasn't quite learned enough to pinpoint the sources. But when it does, unlike the, the optical image that you see, you see lots of dust, it's obscuring the light. You, there are smudges and things get squished together, they're distorted. In the, in the next image down, there are, there are cosmic rays, which tend to come from the same things that create neutrinos, but you don't see any real definition. And that's because both of those things are light, and light gets absorbed and scattered and distorted on the way, but the neutrinos, when we're able to detect them, will give us a high-resolution image of where these things are coming from. Un completely uninterrupted by stars or planets that have anything that happens to get in the way. But there are other big cosmic issues that are important when it comes to neutrinos. And this is, I think, uh, one that a lot of people mention when they try to understand the importance of neutrinos. And that is, if you look at this image, this is an image from the James Webb Space Telescope. This is one of the highest resolution images we have of, of some of the oldest stars in the, in the universe. If you look at this, there's no antimatter there. This is all matter. And the, even though we can't go there, it's, the reason we can tell is that when matter and antimatter get together, they annihilate, and they create energy. 
and they create energy in ways that reflect the particles that, that interact. So if a proton, an electron and, a, and an anti-electron, which we call a positron, hit each other, they create gamma rays that are very distinctive energy. So if part of this was antimatter, you would expect there to be radiation coming from places where the matter and antimatter were touching each other. There'd be sort of a fizz. You wouldn't see explosions. You would see places where that's more, tent, uh, more like when you scatter uh, water on a hot uh, pan that's skittering around. You'd see sort of a fizz of radiation coming to, to you from where matter and antimatter are annihilating, but we don't see that. As far as we can tell, everything in the universe, just about, is made out of matter. Every once in a while you have a heart, hugely energetic event, it creates a little bit of antimatter, that annihilates with matter, and it goes away. So the bulk of the universe is matter. The problem is, before this was here, there was nothing. There was the Big Bang. And you would expect with the Big Bang, what happens is there's energy, that creates matter and antimatter, but it should be in roughly the same proportion. When, not roughly, it should be exactly the same proportion. But when the matter and antimatter get together, they just create energy. So in fact, there should be nothing here. There should be no matter here. All the energy, it should all have been converted into energy. So the question is, why is there anything still here? And neutrinos may hold the answer in two different ways. The first one was proposed by a fellow named Atori Majorana, a very tragic fellow, and you can read about him in the book, actually, here. Um, he was not a very busy physicist. He published about nine papers before he died, mysteriously perhaps thrown or, or fallen off of a boat uh, off the coast of Italy, or perhaps whisked away. It's, it's as yet unclear. It's a huge mystery. But his final paper, he looked at the, the leading physics of the day that described how electrons work, and he said it's ugly. And the reason it's ugly is because we didn't know that antimatter existed. And so it, 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 it treated electrons as being special. And he said, that doesn't make any sense. They, that if matter and antimatter are roughly equivalent, mirror versions of each other, we should have a theory that, that treats them equivalently. The thing is, when you look at that, uh, at that theory, when you look at this more symmetric, this more beautiful version of quantum mechanics, it implies that if there is a a particle, a cousin particle to the electron that has no charge, which is the neutrino, that that particle should be potentially its own antimatter particle. So this is, this is my cartoon of electron neutrino. What he said that is that if it's born as an electron neutrino, this theory tells you that it could spontaneously convert to an antineutrino and back again. It actually goes through a, a sort of oscillation, not unlike this oscillation, where it's specifically oscillating between matter and antimatter. So that's not a big deal, because if all neutrinos do that, you would expect about half of it to be matter and half to be matter antimatter anyway, as they oscillate back and forth. But you can now consider a special case. Um, this, this cartoon shows you a particle that undergoes an interaction known as a double beta decay. So if you remember beta decay from earlier, an electron is produced and a neutrino is produced, and it balances out quantum mechanics. But what I didn't mention is that it also has to balance out that, that single beta decay. It has to balance out the matter-antimatter uh, issue. So every time a, a matter electron is emitted, an antimatter neutrino is created. There are some atoms that only undergo double beta decay. This only happens at exactly the same time, and it has to do with the number of, of nucleons inside the, inside the atom, but we know what these things are. And if, if this happens, and if, if Majorana is correct, one of those two neutrinos can spontaneously become an antimatter neutrino. If it does, they're very close to each other. There's a very small chance, still smaller still, that they could then annihilate each other. And so what you see at the end is this. You see a, an atom creating two matter particles and no antimatter. So what we have with double beta decay, if this happens, is a spontaneous way to increase the amount of matter in the universe. Potentially, you could go the other way, and there are reactions that could do the same thing and decrease, decrease the amount of matter. That, in, that is to say, they could increase the amount of antimatter. But if there's an imbalance between the two, this is a way that you can create more matter in the universe than antimatter. This is known pretty obviously, is neutrinoless double beta decay. It's not that the neutrinos don't exist, it's that they exist so briefly that you don't see them effectively at all. And these are some of the cutting edge current experiments going on in, in neutrino physics today, is to look for this. Now it's gonna take huge amounts of material because this is a very rare 
uh, um, event, and it may take more material than, it, than it's financially feasible to do, but in the next 10 years or so, we should hopefully have an answer about that. And that might account for the residue of matter that makes up stars, planets, and all of us. There's another way that neutrinos could be involved in, in this imbalance, assuming that the imbalance wasn't somehow baked into the Big Bang, but we assume that that's not the issue. And that's an experiment that's being built today in Illinois. And what they're doing is taking neutrinos and creating them in, at Fermilab Observatory and sending them through the Earth. And as I mentioned earlier, neutrinos oscillate, but as they move through matter, they oscillate differently. In fact, it's a little like shining light through a fish tank. The, the light is affected, but it still makes it through. In this case, it tends to speed the oscillations. We know enough about the math of neutrino oscillations to know how much they should oscillate as they move from a detector in Illinois. This is a, this is a cartoon of the Earth, by the way. It's a little, not to scale, uh, obviously. But we know how much they should oscillate as they go from their source to their detector on the other end. And the system that they have in Fermilab, they can decide whether they want to send neutrinos through or antineutrinos. When you switch that, you should expect to see exactly the same oscillations for both neutrinos and antineutrinos. If you don't, it means that, that even, if we isn't a, even if this isn't a way to create antimatter or matter, it does show that there's a difference between antimatter and matter in the universe and could explain why there's an imbalance and what we see we call, we call matter. Um, that experiment is, is being built currently, and we should, we've seen results from smaller experiments that have suggested that there is indeed this imbalance between oscillations with matter and antimatter neutrinos, but we'll know the answer for, uh, for certain probably in just a few years from, from Dune. There's one other issue, uh, well, there's a few more, but one that is perhaps a little uh, 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 frivolous, it might sound frivolous, but in fact, one of the first things that people thought when uh, neutrinos were detected was, what a great way it would be for aliens to communicate with us. Because as I pointed out, the neutrinos that come to us from other sources are not interrupted. If an alien wanted to send you a signal and knew that you had a neutrino detector, they could point it at your planet, and if a star got in the way, that's fine. If a planet gets in the way, that's fine. If there's dust, there's not an issue. If you have a detector and the, neutrinos, and the aliens want to talk to you, neutrinos would be a really great way to do it, which might ha help us to answer this fundamental question, which is, where is everybody in the universe? You may have heard about an equation called the Drake Equation, which suggests that our place in the universe is not special. And so we would expect there to be lots of places where there are aliens that are just as intelligent as, intelligent as us, and perhaps a great deal more intelligent. But we haven't seen any sign of them. It could be that they've been trying to reach us with neutrinos instead of light, which is how we've been looking for aliens so far, and still are looking for aliens. This is the uh, um, a, a detector in, uh, uh, um, suddenly escapes me in Puerto Rico, which has recently collapsed. Um, but we're still looking for aliens primarily by trying to observe the, 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 the light that they might be sending to us. But then, recently, um, people have suggested, and this is, this is a neutrino emitter at Fermilab. This is the one that they use, that they're going to be using in Dune to test how, how neutrinos oscillate. But it's possible that something like this could be what aliens are using instead. And there are some researchers from the University of Hawaii, some uh, uh, John... Um, Lerner, who is one of the leading uh, neutrino physicists, who pointed out, who's pointed out that all you need to do is to modify these systems to, to encode signals. And some researchers from uh, Daniel Stansel from uh, Virginia Tech actually went to Fermilab and briefly took over their neutrino machine to do this very thing. They took the, the, the neutrino source and they flicked it on and off. And they encoded the word neutrino and sent it through solid rock to a detector about 230 meters away. Now, neutrino sources are not designed to be flicked on and off, which means that their data rate was about 0.1 bits per second. You're probably used to phones that communicate with gigahertz. Uh, this is slow enough that I could have carried a note 240 meters faster than they could send it with neutrinos. The difference is I can't pass through solid rock. Now, we can send some signals through short distances in solid rock, but they could, they could, in theory, have used this to send a signal all the way to the other side of the planet, which, if you build a system that is designed to send a signal, could, would be the fastest route to get something to the other side of the planet. But not only the other side of the planet, it would work on much, much larger scales. This is a, a cartoon that, that, uh, that the researchers who are proposing this communication 
uh, came up with. I don't want to go into all the details. I do want to point out that the energy they have here, it says 10 PeV uh, muons. PeV is peta electron volts. That's, so this, that means this machine is 10,000 times more energetic than any we have uh, in existence right now. So their proposal is not that we build this. Their proposal is that aliens already have. And that the distance you see, 10 kiloparsecs, between the, 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 the beam neutrinos after what's called the muon killer that cleans out all the muons and just leaves uh, neutrinos, that's 10 kiloparsecs. That's about the size of the, of the galaxy. So an alien with technology not supremely far beyond what we can do, just a little bit beyond what we can do, could, on the other side of the galaxy, point one of these at us and send it to us, and our detectors are plenty sensitive to see this. So they've already started, to some extent, looking for, uh, for signals in neutrino detectors. We haven't seen it yet. There are disadvantages to, to using neutrinos, but there are advantages as well, as I pointed out. Anywhere in this image of the galaxy, if there were aliens that wanted to communicate with us, they could just point these at us, and we would see the signals coming from them, or we could send them back to them. The, one of the advantages is that you can precisely target who you want to send it to, and that's because some aliens might want to eat us, and you want to talk to everybody. If, you want to, if you're sending signals in light, it's very difficult to send a beam in one direction, and you might send it to the wrong people. So they've proposed that the safest way to communicate with aliens or to listen for aliens would be with neutrinos. The other advantage is unlike light energy, where you would have to create a very bright source of light, it'd be very expensive. Once you've developed the technology to make neutrino beams, since I'm only sending it to one person, it's very efficient, or one, one planet, one star system. Um, but there is yet another way that they, they've suggested that you could use neutrinos to, to communicate. And that is by looking at, a, at some stars in our galaxy called Cepheid variables. Now, Cepheid variable stars are these uh, fluctuating stars. They, they produce bursts of light, usually very regular intervals. But the, the reason we believe they oscillate is because they're inherently unstable. There are these things that are, that are, that are just randomly fluctuate, or, well, they're very, very repeatedly fluctuating, but they're, they're easy to perturb. And so it's possible that we could take advantage of this by using what they call neutrino beam ticklers. You would take a neutrino beam, and when I say you, I mean an alien, if there are any aliens here, and you would fire it as Cepheid variable, slightly off-center, and cause it to flash at a different pace than it would normally uh, flash. Once, you're doing, once you've done that, you can, cause, you can now encode signals in, uh, in the Cepheid variable stars, which everyone in the galaxy and the nearby galaxies could see as well, uh, and encode, hello, universe, here I am, or something like that. They published a paper, and they call this the Cepheid Galactic Internet. They are, people are currently looking at Cepheids to see if there's any of these signals. So far, nothing has come, uh, come about. Uh, maybe fortunately, it's hard to say. And I just want to cover one more issue. I hope I have time for that. And that is that we have ways of looking at the early universe. Uh, we can look at the oldest stars. But really, right now, the oldest way you can... The, the oldest structures we can see in the universe, we see with light. And that is, this is an image of the cosmic microwave background. But the cosmic microwave background didn't come at the beginning. At the very beginning of the Big Bang, there was inflation. It was a very hot and dense uh, universe. It would, it, it would be impossible to use light to see inside of it. It was scattered. It, it's, uh, it's, I can't quite remember the phrase for it. But the, the, the point is that the, the universe beyond in the early 375,000 years before the, uh, the, um, the cosmic microwave background is completely unreachable to us with light. So we're here at, the, at this end where dark energy has started to cause the uh, universe to expand, and the cosmic microwave background is there 375,000 years after the beginning of the universe. So the question is, what's in here? And that's an interesting question. We have no idea. But the thing is, neutrinos, as we mentioned, can pass through the Earth and all sorts of things completely uh, uninterrupted. And so the neutrinos that were formed at the very beginning of the universe have been streaming out from the beginning of the universe ever since. That means that if we could find a way to see those neutrinos, we could see back to the first second of the universe. We have no idea what we're going to see that, at that point, and nothing else could show us except for neutrinos. Uh, gravitational waves might give you an idea of what it sounded like. Uh, we know that gravitational waves could make it from beyond the cosmic microwave background, but only with neutrinos will you be able to, if you ever can, build a detector to see them to look back at the beginning of the universe. 
And in fact, when I mention that there are 300 to 500 neutrinos in, in the tip of your little finger right now, most of those are those neutrinos. They're the relic neutrinos from the very beginning of the universe. You, it, it's, it's amazing to me that we are effectively in touch with them. We can't see them yet, but we know that they're there, and there are schemes that will allow us to detect them sometime in the future. And it's not that far away. Schemes have been, have been proposed. They're technically challenging, but it's only a technical issue. It's not, it's not scientifically unfeasible. So just all in all, these are what I consider uh, some of the cosmic important issues with neutrinos. There's a great deal more that I couldn't get into uh, because of the book, and I hope you take time to read it. In the meantime, pick and choose what you think are the most important things, whether that's the, the, the neutrinos in your fingertip that tell us about the beginning of the universe or communicating with aliens or one of these other things. And I appreciate so much your time <laughs> listening to me uh, wax on about uh, neutrinos. <laughs>